How's it going, guys? Welcome back to Blue Shooting. Welcome back to Seabed. Where, uh, I guess we've had our big revelation of at least probably one of the bigger revelations. I've been hoodwinked. I kind of called it. I had, I had a feeling that Dr. Narasaki wasn't quite real. <laughs> I didn't realize she was super not real, as in she was a doll. And, uh,. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. There's a lot going on. I feel like we're finally... I wonder if we're getting close to the end now, because I feel like we're starting to get answers. Oh, by the way, you may notice, I have new headphones. So my cat ruined my last set of headphones. It's like $30 headphones down the drain. Not even that expensive, honestly, but it's just annoying. So I'm using my PlayStation 1, so it's got the little whoop right here. But other than that, it's just the same. <laughs> it just looks a little silly now that I'm seeing it. I might have to splurge and get something a little nicer, but you know, at the same time, it's not a really big deal. Anyway, so, Dr. Narasaki is just a doll. Um, Kozoa might be leaping between worlds through her bedroom. And the tips also seem to be in a time of, in a wibbly wobbly, timey wimey thing. So, what is even real? Are any of them real? I hope the Tokniko is real. It's the happier play, like timeline. <sighs> but we'll have to see. Uh... <laughs> uh, and also, thank you so much. Uh, last time we had a couple good comments. I'm going to go with um, Tendrasi's little comment where you said, I mean, what even is reality? You're right. What? I mean, why? Why even try and understand it, right? No, we have to know. We ha There has to be an answer. But thank you for the comments. As always, it's really fun to look forward to that. And of course, like I think that's going to be the theme of this episode. Now that we've had a kind of bombshell drop of uh, of Doctor Narasaki's true like form and meaning and all that, it's like what even is real? Like what even is real? So anyway, let's jump right back into it. So like we're in Sachiko's memory of a dream of some kind. I can hear the cry of the cicadas around me. The hot, humid air felt heavy on my skin. It's like opposite of what I'm feeling right now. It's like freezing. Like it's like it's 38 degrees outside Fahrenheit, by the way, because you know we're we're idiots and we use you know, use the metric system. Oh, this is gonna bother me now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a little dim, a little cold, but I actually kind of like it. Like I, I gotta wear my sweater. I gotta wear my like long like fuzzy pants. You know, it's 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 pleasant enough. The row of large trees extended in front of me. There was a slide connected to the jungle gym, a swing, a tire, half buried in the ground, and a sandbox. I turned around and saw a row of tall trees behind me. They reminded me of cedars, but their leaves were flat and big. There were a green fence behind them. And beyond this fence, there was a wide, deep ditch. I couldn't see the bottom from here, but I could tell there was a river, roughly five meters deep, running through it. Five meters deep. Five meters deep, that'd be like 15 feet deep? Yeah, it's decent. The park area was shaped like a shark cake, situated between the ditch and the road. How dangerous to have a playground right next to a body of water. I wonder if this is another dream. Wow! I'm guessing that's Takago. Takago let out a shout as she dashed toward me. Whoa, 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 whoa! Holy crap, that's like... We got full-grown Sachiko and little kid Takako. What the heck? I caught her by her armpits and lifted her up, making her stop. She raised one of her hands in an attempt to imitate Superman. That's not what we're playing here. Disappointed, she dropped her arm. Do you know who I am? My bride. That's the girl who passed me by me earlier, no? A shocking realization came over Takako, making her blink a few times. That's right. Good grief. I look around the park, still holding Takako. What is even happening? There were a bunch of faded toys scattered in the sandbox. I couldn't tell whether the sun was partially hidden by the mountain range or rising in, or, or was rising or setting. The sky had a light pink hue, with only a few light clouds drifting on it. L let me down! I put her back on solid ground. Hm. Is there bugs you like, miss? I'll catch it for you. I don't need any insects. Then what do you want to play? Tag? I'd rather not. 
Oh, I can show you something great! And she goes off to the side. She hurried over to the swing, climbing up the right one, and began swinging up and down. I followed her, but before I could reach her, she crouched down in the in the preparation of a jump, then let go of the bars. She landed on the teal on the teal bar in front of the swing, but inertia carried her too far. She began tilting forward. Ugh! How many times do you want to get hurt doing this? I caught her before she hit the ground. <laughs> Thanks. I'll catch you a dragonfly in return. I really don't want any bugs. It's here! A large insect flew past my head. Takako chased after it. I watched her disappear into the distance, then pinched my hand. It hurt a bit. When I looked back at Takako, I saw her standing in place, gazing at a certain spot. She slowly extended her arm. Her hand suddenly moved and seized something. Got it! She rushed back toward me, carrying her prey. The dragonfly that flew past my head earlier now sat motionless in Takako's palm. Her fingers were holding down its wings, preventing it from moving. Aww. I think it damages the wings. I caught a dragonfly! Did you actually catch it with your bare hands? It's the first time I managed to pull that off! Impressed? You're going to give it your, you're going to give it to your friend, correct? Yeah. You think she'll forgive me? Don't forget to bring her the doll, too. It's important to her. Okay. And that's Dr. Narasaki! The small Takago pulled out an insect cage from the backpack under the slide and placed the dragonfly into it. She then shoved the case back into her backpack. She pulled the doll into the backpack. She put the doll into the backpack as well. I briefly glanced at my wristwatch. It was six o'clock. Are you going home? Are you going home? Takako asked as she returned. Yes. Let's play a bit more. I wish I could, but I have to hurry back. I feel like I was in the middle of something important. Aww. As Takako heaved a sigh of disappointment, I pinched, I pinched my hand again. This time, I did it a bit harder. I felt no different from last time. Hmm. I looked around the park, and then up at the sky. Its color was an odd mixture of purple and pink, the kind I'd never seen before. Um, do you know how I can leave? I asked the small Takako. Takako shook her head. I suppose you wouldn't. If you got nowhere to go, you can come to my house. Aww. Even little kid Takako is adorable. Takako pulled the hem of my skirt as I wondered what to do. I took a step toward her to avoid getting stretched, but Takako interpreted that as a sign of consent and began walking further. We left the park and passed the street with a tenement house at the corner, emerging onto a slope stretching deep into the mountain. I spotted a thick cable car wire above it. Turning around, I noticed that the house behind me had disappeared. Uh-oh. Before I knew it, I was walking on a stone pavement. Is this really the right way? Yeah, don't worry. I watched a cable car descend the slope. What is happening? It, its rear half of the box was, uh, it was, it was... Its rear half of the box was seats and windows. It reminded me of the red tin can on the wooden windows. With wooden windows. I had various posters inside, each depicting different advertisements ranging from movies to shoe shops. The empty cable car stopped on the rotating plate and turned around. Takako grabbed one of its rails and was about to get in. Are we riding this thing? Yeah! Okay. Wait, whoa, 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 wait. When I heard cable car, I was thinking cable cars in like the boxes that go up the- but I guess they do call those cable cars, don't we? Not, where are we? Takako got inside and climbed into the long bench by the window. I sat down next to Takako and glanced the same direction as her. Colorful bright brick and concrete houses surrounded the slopes we ascended. Their roofs lined up like stairs, serving as balconies for even higher buildings. Is something the matter? Look. Takako looked at me. Then pointed, then, uh, then pointed at the big window at the back of the car. I could see the harbor beyond it. The slopes were ascending, uh, cleaved in west, uh, cleaved the western city in two, almost like Moses did the Red Sea in ancient times. So now we're in San Francisco. Further beyond, a wide cobalt green sea stretched as far as the eye could see. A few vanilla colored, colored clouds drifted across the blue sky above. I went there with Sachiko the other day. 
We boarded a ship! Takako pointed at the lone island in the distance. I've never been there. Really? It was fun. Takako lowered herself down to the bench. They're good. You're good friends. Yeah. One time, I wanted to show her my new trick with stilts, but I fell and scraped my legs so much it started bleeding. She ended up taking me to the hospital. Ah, oh, those were pretty tall, weren't they? I should have known it was a bad idea when you needed to climb onto the roof just to get on them. Oh my gosh! The cable car passed under a large tree, the leaves of which cast gently flickering shadows. Really stilts that tall? Like, that must be like eight foot tall stilts. Taco took out the insect box from her bag and observed the dragonfly. After getting bored of that, she took out the doll and began moving its hands. Okay, here we go. Let's play Shiritiro. Shiritori. Shir Shiritori. I said that totally wrong the first time. I'm so sorry. Squirrel. Lettuce. Egg. Oh, okay. It's that, it's that, um... So, they're obviously doing a translation version of that, but so... So, Shiritori... Shiritori must be the, the game where you have to say a word that begins with the sound of the last word's ending. So in, in English, or I guess you could, you could say Romaji, but this is really English, they're just doing the last letter. But in Japanese it's a bit more interesting because it has it's the last uh, the word. And isn't the goal, if I remember, I think they even said it in this, in this visual novel, that the goal ultimately is to find, to, to Get a word that ends with the um, the single n sound the, that looks like a little like a little like depressed h, because no words in Japanese start with that. So if you get that word down, then you win. Giraffe, eagle, earthworm, mango, opal, lettuce, egg, giraffe, eagle, earthworm, mango, opal. Lettuce. Egg. Hey. Hey, you can't hey, you can't repeat them. You lose. Doctor Girl leaned against me as I gazed into the scenery beyond the window. Her eyes were closed when she rocked back and forth with each bump. Are you sleeping? No. Um is your house really that far? Don't worry. We passed under a large tree and leaves which cast gently flickering shadows. I went to a picnic with Sachiko. Just the, just you two? Narasaki was there too. Sachiko made a lunchbox for each of us. Her eyeball and it tasted really sweet. With that, Takako fell asleep on my shoulder. I looked out the car's front window and saw a vast cobalt blue sea in the distance. Turning around, I saw the exact same view behind us. Western buildings and trees along the sea. The only difference of the two were the colors. Looking at Takako sleeping on my shoulder, I too closed my eyes in the gently swaying car. Well, we've definitely entered the Twilight Zone. Holy crap. What is happening? What is reality? It's a question. Ooh, it's doing that weird underwater music. Feeling someone shake my shoulders, I opened my eyes. We're here! Still half asleep, I followed Takako out of the car. There was a the sound of a bell, and the cable car began turning around. Here! Takako pulled me by the hand. Into the forest. The sensation of, ground of the ground changed. As, this, as I shook off my drowsiness, I realized we were on a mountain path surrounded by tall trees. With leaves above blo blocking out most of the light, I couldn't quite make out how far the trail extended. We're almost there! Yes. I know, this is gonna end badly, isn't it? After a short while, we reached a, a tunnel made of brick and stones. We continued inside, the faint light behind us waning like a candle flame. The darker it got, the colder it felt inside, until it disappeared altogether. <sighs> Come on, Takako. I'm lost! But all we did was walk in a straight line. You want to go back? Takako stopped, her hand clutching mine. I, I picked a bunch of different paths, but I no longer remember which ones. I didn't notice at all. What do we do now? You have no idea where we are at all? It's dark in here. Well, it certainly is. Oh, man.
Could that all just been a dream? Hello, fake person who's not real. I know you. You can't trick me again. I walked across the shallow beach, the stars flickering in the water puddles as I stepped on them. However, the scenery would not change, no matter how far I walked. It was either a starry sky, or a starry sky with some holes repeating over and over. Well, now... I stuck my right index finger into my mouth and bit down on it. It hurt. Glancing at one of the puddles, I saw the reflection of a woman with long black hair, black eyes, staring back at me. I closed one of my eyes, and so did she. I shifted my gaze to the back to the horizon. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's the thing. I think Narasaki is just a personality of Sachiko. And so, like, what's happening now is she's, like, she went to go look for Sachiko. She saw her in a puddle, and then she's just seeing her reflection. But she's having to confront this now. I stuck my hand in my pocket, finished, and fished out my car keys. They felt cold to the touch. I turned them a few times in my hand and continued toward the horizon. Suddenly, I felt like I heard something. I took a few more steps, and the noise, kind of static reminiscent of hearing tests, increased. I stopped and strained my ears to listen. The sound was coming from below. However, there was only a puddle of water at my feet, its surface reflecting a massive black cloud. Oh boy. Just when I looked up, the puddle suddenly swallowed me. Heavy rain poured all over me. I was still on the same shallow beach, except now it was in the middle of the storm. As I glanced at the black cloud, the rainfall grew in intensity. Following the apparent source of the sound, the place where it felt like it loudest, I soon reached a tropical forest of sorts. We're going back to that cabin. I rushed there to escape the rain. Water trickled down my down by my hair, getting into my eyes. Suddenly I heard something from the woods. Is someone there? I spotted traces of footsteps in the direction and sound the sound was coming from. I followed them, noticing some broken branches along the way as well. I stepped over a big set of rocks rising from the ground and climbed the limestone rock blackened by the elements to find a hole splitting the path in two. It was the entrance to a cave surrounded by ferns. Look at how huge it is. I heard something reminiscent of human voices from within. This reminds me of the very first episode when Takako and Sachiko were out visiting, like, I don't know, I felt like it was like somewhere like in the Mediterranean, I think. Is someone there? I repeated my question. My words reverberated across the cave walls. I waited for a dozen or so seconds, but received no reply. I climbed down the hole. Having reached an area with a solid roof, the sound of the rain from outside began to abate. Instead, I heard the scarce, whip, drip, uh, scarce dripping of water. There were countless paths branching off in various directions in front of me. Some were too narrow for a person to pass, while others seemed good enough to drive a car through. All of them had complex shapes, like lava stones. I pressed forward, trying to find some even footing, when I heard disjointed voices from the sum of the tunnels. Wanted to show me? Fireflies! You mean... Was told you wanted to see! I followed the voices until I saw a light beyond the black rock. I'm guessing who they are, by the way. Ah. Huh. I heard a voice right by my ear. Whoa! As I stepped on a puddle of water, my legs got swallowed by it. Oh, that'd be weird. The sensation was similar to missing a step on the stairs, and at losing my balance and plummeting down into a dark void. Narasaki's is in limbo. So Sachiko's in a dream. Narasaki's literally flying between worlds. I opened my eyes, only to realize I was slowly sinking. As I regained control of my body, I extended my arms and landed at the bottom. Well, this is a predicament. What the fetch is happening? The water was crystal clear. If one discount discounted the sensation of weightlessness, this was hardly different from inside the cave. I exhaled a breath. I didn't feel uncomfortable at all. Now here's interesting. She's wearing a lab coat, but underneath she almost looks like she's wearing like uh, like an apron that you would wear as a patient, not like actual clothing. But maybe I'm just trying to make connections here. I exhaled a breath. Didn't feel uncomfortable at all. The air bubbles ascended, getting sucked toward the light coming from the hole I fell through. Um, this... I heard a voice from beyond the water. There was a dark cave entrance right in the middle of the seabed. I turned around and began walking toward it. 
felt like I was walking on clouds. Although I drew further from the light coming from the hole, it, it painted the entire place blue, almost like it had simply melted into the water. I was moving onwards, with one hand on the wall, when I heard some voices again. Can I just say... How cool would it be if you didn't have to worry about breathing and could just walk across the bottom of the water? Like, I've always thought it'd be fun to, like, go to a beach of some kind and, like, have the tanks and uh, uh, for air and everything and then have, like, a big rock or something to hold you down so you just kind of stay on the bottom. Like, just heavy enough to keep you planted and then you can just kind of, like, walk across the bottom of the ocean. That'd be so cool. Although it's really dangerous because there's lots of things that can bite you or sting you that can hide in the sand. Okay, I'm gonna guess this is Takako. Wow! There's a window here! I can see the vegetables in the inner yard from here! There was a huge window covered by the stairs, too. Wonder if they built them later. They must have been in quite a hurry when they did that. Few people nowadays think of modern architecture as superior. Hang on. This actually might be the people who own the sanatorium. Ah, look how small that door is. I wonder if it's a broom closet. Oh, it's locked. You can ask the landlord about it later. I'll do that. I wonder if this is their... I, wa I wonder if it's this room. The, pla the plate matches the key, at least. Let me see if it fits the lock. It's bigger than I thought. Concrete walls, huh? We could raise heck in here when no one would hear us. I'm not planning to do anything like that. I'll open the windows. All right. So we're, so we're taking this one? Yeah. Okay. We'll have to get our stuff then. Tomorrow's going to be a busy day. Indeed. I continued down the rocky path, sweeping my hand through the water. What the heck? Now it looks like there's a galaxy behind her. Are you there? My voice turned into bu oh, are you there? My voice turned into bubbles, disappearing in the darkness above me. I realized the cave ceiling had grown low enough for me to reach it. The path turned more uneven, so I slowed my pace and continued in careful steps. I spotted the silhouette of a crouching person in front of a large rock in the distance. As I drew closer, I realized it was just an old doll. Yeah, it was you. The path would grow narrow, then widen up again. However, the rock walls surrounding me on both sides remained the same. I completely lost sense of how far I'd walked. I could no longer hear anything beside the echo of the dripping water and my own footsteps. Boy, I I ended the last episode right on the brink of insanity. On the other side of the rock, there was a huge puddle of water. I also spotted a large hole in the rock beyond it. Though I caught a glimpse of some green trees and darkened sky beyond the hole, most of the view was blocked by the water pouring down it through like a waterfall. The ceiling rocks around it glimmered in a pale bluish hue. As the dark cloud passed over the hole, the ceiling lit up like a sky illuminated by stars. I realized that my body felt very heavy. The sensation of walking underwater faded, and I was once again back on solid ground. I stopped for a while to observe the blue stars, which formed no constellations whatsoever, as well as the puddle in the waterfall. The path ended here. I looked down into the water. It looked like a stairway continuing down without end. I want to see it. I could have sworn I heard Kozuo's voice. Oh, that was... I want to see it. I'm too tired to go back now. Okay. I stepped into the water and was transported to a shining blue world. Whoa. Trench. After the voices ceased, I continued on the lone path for a while. Soon enough, I started hearing something in the distance again. It reminded me of a rock falling on something hard, or perhaps a chess piece swiftly being placed on a board. It could be water falling onto a metal plate. Remember the girl that was with us when we talked to Lily? Yes. Don't you think she's just like you when you were little? Really? In what way? Her unsociable attitude and quick wits. Actually, that part of you hasn't changed at all. When did you become like that? 
I think I was born this way. Takako has social sociability for the both of us for the both of us. And you are the brains for you both. That sounds about right. Huh. One was the social, one was the brains. Suddenly one of my legs sank into the ground. I saw a puddle, black as ink, as I glanced down. Beyond the slope behind me, I saw sparkling water surface. Above it fluttered a starlit sky. The black puddle by my feet grew bigger, separating the water from water like a will. The heavy water, like a black mirror, gave a clear reflection of my body. I tried stepping forward, creating a ripple in the blackness, and I felt my shoe press against the hard, rocky bottom underneath it. I put my other leg into the blackness. I felt like I had stepped into the deep sea. There was solid ground at my feet, yet I continued sinking. Oh boy. The blackness enveloped me, robbing me of sight. However, the ground evened out, making it easier to walk forward. I strained my ears to hear another sound. It reminded me of the clanging of dishes. Not in this world now. It smells great, but I like it when it's more sweet. Why would you want to ruin the taste of something this delicious? This flavor might have been a bit too early for this flavor might have been a bit too early for you, Takako. I heard Sachiko, Takako, and the voice of another woman I didn't know. Oh, okay, this is back in the office. Instant tea is already more than good enough. Uh, instant tea is more already more than good enough for her. Is that still apple tea? Yeah, Sachiko brought brings it home sometimes. It's a bit too sweet, but it's not too bad for the price. And this is instant green tea, right? I can't remember what I did for her voice. Yep. It only has Ceylon written on the label. Ceylon? You mean Sri, Sri Lanka? Speaking of tea, speaking of tree band from Sri Lanka, Five Kinds is a good one. Wow, that's a cool name. Sounds like it's almost someone's superhero show. It refers to five tea leaves. Uva, Candy, Nirwara, Ilaya, Dimbulia, and Ruhuna. It sounds like Deji, uh, <laughs> It sounds like Darjeeling tea. Ranger Red! Okay, <laughs> there we go. Keep going, Takako. That's the only color it has, though. This is the background before you explode when you drink your apple tea. Wouldn't it be a problem if you could buy something so dangerous so easily? We should blackmail them and claim an entire tea shop for ourselves. Yeah! You two are starting to lose me. And it's not even and it's not even spring yet. Good grief. I couldn't even keep track of the dialogue there either. The voices grew louder as I continued and began to fade as though I just walked past them. When the voices completely ceased, I strained my ears again, but I could no longer hear a thing. I tried saying something to myself, but it had no effect. I couldn't perceive anything besides the ground of my feet, so I didn't even know what the wide, uh, how wide the cave was right now. After confirming the conditions of the auditory landscape, I started walking again. Something akin to mist appeared in the darkness in front of me. Oh, hello, Takako. It looked like kind of red and blue at the same time. As I followed it with my eyes, a small girl appeared in the corner of my eye and dashed further into the cave. She looked like Takako in her childhood. I didn't really actually see her directly. It was just a reflection on the cave wall. Hello, brightness. I narrowed my eyes while looking at that huge black mirror when a light suddenly lit up behind me. Its reflection on the wall momentarily rendered me blind. Uh... Okay, I turned the page. From now we're Sachiko. The rays of the evening sun filtered through the window of the dead si silent classroom. The white curtains fluttered as a gust, a gust of cold wind swept into the room through the open window, cooling my cheeks. I glanced at the clock. I could hear a plane and the voices of children in the distance. Let's do this. I suddenly heard Takako's voice from outside. So I was, let's do this! Well? Wow! It actually got stuck in the trunk! I looked down from the window to see Takako, one of our classmates, throwing something at a cherry blossom tree behind the judo house. What on earth are you two doing there? Our English teacher appeared from the window of the school building. Oh crap! <laughs> Everyone around the tree scattered like scattered shadowed animals. 
The teacher went after Takako, who seemed to be the most likely ringleader, and caught her by the collar. He then pulled her back into the building. I glanced at the clock again and returned to my book. After about 50 pages, I heard a footsteps in the corridor. Ah! Takako entered the classroom with a sigh. Huh? I thought you already left, Sachiko. I forgot my key, so I need to wait until my sister gets home. I see. Let's go home together, then. She sat down in her seat, which was right in front of mine. Oh, that's right. I wanted you to help me with home homework. But we didn't get anything today. I had to write a written apology in English. What did you do this time? Dargo took out a small steel plate from her skirt pocket and handed it to me. The rest got confiscated. Is that the shuriken you brought during our last school trip? I used the waste stone in, in, in the industrial arts room to sharpen them. Oh, and I wouldn't recommend touching the edges. The edges of the steel glimmered in the sharp silver light. Are you, are you serious? The teachers got angry at me when I tested them on a tree. Of course they did. Are you crazy? I do feel sorry, okay? Doctor let out a groan. So what exactly happened with the teachers there? They said the trees could start to rot if you damage their bark. That's all? Then they told me to consider how I feel if someone threw things at me. And did you? Taco clutched her stomach and fell to her knees. Are you still planning to keep that up? No. Then you don't need this anymore. I folded my handkerchief around the shriek and put it in my bag. Huh? When are you taking it? I'll bring it to the teacher's room. They can do away with it like they did with the rest. Wait! You don't have a use for it anymore, do you? Yeah, it's sentimental value. I know you won't be able to resist if it's right in front of your eyes. She considered me with imploring eyes. She considered me with imploring eyes for a few moments, then clutched her head and collapsed to the desk with her, with her upper body. You've no idea how long it took me to sharpen them. She let out another groan. You're always having fun. Takako lazily raised her face up with her upper body still on the desk. And you're not? Okay, so like last time was supposed to be Sachiko. Aside from studying, not really. I don't like to be around so many people. Really? Yes. The sound of the bat hitting a ball reached us from the baseball field. The school buildings beyond the window were cherry blossoms around them. The scenery of the town in the distance had been all painted orange by the evening sun. All right, are we just in stream of consciousness at this point? Cause good grief, nothing feels connected. <sighs> All right, I saw to go again. Looking around, I saw a brick wall in the distance. On the metal hole through which I could see some greenery. I approached it and tried touching the leaves, but my hand passed through them like they were fog. After that, they immediately vanished. We're in that cave still? I'm scared. Taco clasped the hem of my skirt with both her hands. I, I can't walk like this. I stuck my hands under her armpits and lifted her up. Aww. This is weird, but cute. I took a few steps back and lowered myself onto a big rock, ending with Takako on my lap. We're not walking anymore? We're just taking a short break. What the heck? Where did she have that? I feel Takako wiggling on my knees even though I couldn't see her. The sound of dripping water reverberated across the tunnel's walls. I heard a gulp. Are you thirsty? Thanks. I reached out toward her and took the thermos bottle lid from her. The liquid inside was cool, but I couldn't quite tell the taste. Did you have tea in this? It was either water, tea, or juice. I took another sip. If it was water, it should have been tasteless. If it were tea, there should have been a bit of bitter aftertaste, and the juice should have had a certain sweetness to it. I forgot. I can't tell either. After I finished the contents of the lid, I placed it on Takako's head for her to take away. Want more? I'm fine. I felt Takako move my, to my, on my lap again. What's wrong? Let's go. Did you remember the correct way? No, but... 
Then it's okay. Let's rest for a little while longer. Staring into the darkness, I spotted something in the corner of my eye that reminded me of letters. I shifted my gaze to them, but they blurred together and disappeared like water paint. Uh. Are you angry? Dr. Go asked. Why do you think that? Well, we got lost because of me. I'm not angry. Really? Don't worry. It shouldn't be that hard to find a way out of here. Hmm. But yeah, I'm not angry. But you never think anything through. You should keep that in mind next time. I found Takuyo's face in the darkness and seized her cheeks. Okay. I let her go. I'm hungry. Don't you have some snacks in your bag? Oh, right. Takuyo picked up her backpack. The out of the zipper suit falls soon after. Huh? You ran out? No. There's some candies inside. Here you go. Takuyo handed me the candy. I felt something hard around being placed into my palm. Takuyo bit through her own with an audible crunch. I popped the candy in my mouth. It had a sweet artificial aroma, but I couldn't identify exactly what fruit it was supposed to be. Yeah, this definitely seems like a dream more than anything else. Takuyo continued munching away on her candy. After a while, she stopped moving, and I could hear her breathing even though, even out as she dozed off. Oh, that's... All of a sudden, I heard approaching footsteps. Uh, hey! Turning towards the source of the sound, I saw some dim lights in the distance. It grew bigger as the footsteps drew closer, making my eyes hurt. Ah, hello. You. Through my narrowed eyes, I could see I could make out Narasaki with a lighter in her hand. She spotted us and raised her hand. Hey! Narasaki. Took, took me a while to find you. You were looking for me? Yep. Narasaki's white coat was drenched in water, making her curves stand out more than usual. What happened to you? You're completely soaked. I had a few adventures on my way here. Narasaki smiled as I started started at the water drop drip, drops drip from her hair. She placed the lighter on the ground and sat down on a rock in front of me. Were you worried about me? Yeah. I thought you might be in trouble again. You truly are obsessed with your work. It's not like I have anything else to do. Oh, I see Doctor goes here too. Long time no see. Upon noticing Takuko, she quickly waved in her direction. I stared at Narasaki. She returned it with a questioning look. I just thought it was odd to see you two together like this. Narasaki made her characteristic faint smile. Time doesn't exist here, so the usual, so the usual, unusual is acting actually not so unusual at all. Because we're in a dream. Not exactly. How is this not a dream? Well, it's not like I can comprehend everything about the phenomenon either, but there are a few crucial things I noticed to separate it from a dream. I'd say this is simply a place where the present and the past cross. Ooh, interesting. What is that supposed to mean? Okay, let me start from explaining how it's different from a dream. Didn't you feel anything unusual on your way to this place? Hmm. I retraced my steps but the small topic go. I thought it was just another dream at first, but I could remember it was in Nanai's mansion just before, and it felt so it felt a bit too realistic. I don't know how to put it. You've got your full wits about you, Narasaki added. Yes, that's it. It's too realistic for a dream, but I can tell it cannot be real. It's as though there's a translucent membrane separating me from it. I guess it feels a bit like when you hypnotized me. Exactly. My hypno hypnosis partially recreated this exact same state. So this is neither reality nor a dream. Yeah. Well, I guess it still depends on your definition of a dream. Oh? Narasaki inhaled a breath. Okay, then. Let me explain both this place and your condition. I still had many questions, but I decided not to interrupt her. Narasaki made a small nod, then opened her mouth. For starters, I wouldn't say you're awake right now. Your condition is similar to sleeping or being hypnotized, but not entirely like that. As I mentioned before, your consciousness is fully alert. 
Now when you're sleep or hypnotized, your consciousness should grow foggy and become receptive to any information with little scrutiny. However, you keep questioning and analyzing everything around you right now, correct? In a way, you could say you somehow ended up in a dream with your consciousness unaffected. It's not something that happens often, though I wouldn't bet on it. So I wouldn't bet on it. Anyway, that's the gist of it. Narsaki showed me her hand and spread her fingers apart. Let's say that each of these fingers represents one of the five senses while the palm is the mind. When you're awake, your hand is open like this. Your fingers are like antennas, transferring information to your mind from the outside world. Narsaki closed the gap between her fingers. When you sleep, your antennas are closed like this. You need to fold them up when your brain organizes the information you receive. Next, she made a fist. And this is your current situation. Your senses have changed directions and are now pointing inward. They are functioning properly, but aren't directed outside. They are trying to get information from inside your mind. Ooh. Can I ask something? Yeah. When you talk about the senses, you mean sight, hearing, touch, and so on, right? How can they face inwards? My eyes, ears, skin, and so on only exist in the real world, right? Of course. It's not your actual sense organs that are inverted, but the channels that information travels through. Just thinking of this as a metaphor or whatever. Just think of this as a metaphor or whatever, she added. Okay. I gave her a hesitant answer. I tried imagining what she meant. Narsaki said nothing over time, so I asked another question. Alright, alright. So, barring the fact that I have no clue if this is even physically possible, if she's doing an inward super reflection right now, like almost like a super meditative state, this could give her access to all of her memories. But that could be also the problem that we're having here is that we're having all of her memories are blending together into one. Ooh, it's gonna be tough to get information out of this. It'd be really interesting if this could actually be a real phenomenon. So, if my senses are inverted right now, what about everything I'm sensing here? It's neither real nor a dream, correct? Now it's like you gestured toward her surroundings. That's one more thing I need to explain about this place and where it actually is. Do you remember how we discussed the alternative world in your head when we were talking about the symptoms of your hallucinations? I remember that event from the real world. It was something I discussed with Narsaki right after waking from this nap from a nap in the rest area at the end of the corridor in Nanae's mansion. Was it when you said the directions would all be inverted? Yes! Then this is the place. You're perceiving that alternative world right now. I tried to understand what she said, but I ended up with more questions. What kind of world was this supposed to be? What did it exist in the first place? What was its purpose? Did it even have any? And why was I here right now? Confused by the endless streams of questions, I began to see contours of my surroundings as increasingly blurry, or perhaps as merely imagining things. Either way, after a blink, everything had returned to normal. I must have been caught by the darkness around us. I glanced at Takako, still resting on my knees, then on my own arms, cradling her. What is happening to me in the real world? Your condition is similar to being lightly hypnotized right now. It's actually a bit problematic, to tell the truth. You've already experienced hypnosis before, so you can probably tell, but some of the memories inaccessible during normal sleep get unlocked in this condition. A professional usually guides you in the right direction while you're in that state, but right now you have no one guiding you. If you stay here for too long, your memories might get all over the place and won't return to their proper location. And without anyone guiding you, there's no one to wake you up either. Wouldn't someone just notice I was sleeping for too long and wake me up? As long as your consciousness is in here, you won't wake up, no matter what they do. Then what am I supposed to do? Come back. Relax. It's actually not that hard. For starters, you've got to draw your consciousness away from here. And the easiest way to do that is simply to sleep. It might be a bit uncomfortable in a place like this, but what can you do? Is there anything else? I'll carry the real you to your bed so you can wake up in your usual place. I imagine Narsaki carrying me on her back. No one had done that to me since I was a child, so I felt a bit embarrassing. But I was asleep, so I probably wouldn't remember it anyway. That's all? Yep, said Narsaki. 
What happens if my memories can't return to their proper location? You said it was odd to see me and the young Takako together. If you stay here for too long, it'll stop seeming that way to you. And it'll get harder and harder to remember reality. In the end, you might even start thinking of reality as a dream and the world are real. I tried to imagine what it would mean to never return. This wasn't a dream, but a world inside my mind. It was different from sleeping, but at the same time, very similar to it. A dream you cannot wake up from. If I stayed here for too long, I wouldn't be able to come back. There's so many things that didn't make any sense to me. It's really, this, is, this is definitely giving me some Inception vibes, you know, like when they go, if you go too deep into the consciousness and you no longer can tell what's real and what's not. This world was ambiguous and uncertain, almost like a fairy tale. Was it because half of my brain was asleep or something? Narasaki waited for my reaction with a gentle expression. It's okay. I know what's on your mind. I think. Your current condition is something akin to having been swallowed by a massive wave and being unable to tell up from down. Oh wait, sorry. This is still Narasaki. Besides, you're sent to an adult even farther in a dark place like this. It's because of this place that I have trouble following this. Yes. Narasaki looked around in the darkness. The light illuminated the rock wall surrounding us. The rocks in the darkness make complex patterns to the boundaries of the light. I watched them until they turned into something akin to a kaleidoscope. I wonder how I ended up like this. I don't know the details. Can we find out? That's something I'd like to know myself. Like, I mean, we're here. We're here in her subconscious right now, and we can unlock memories that have been locked away. Would it really hurt being here long enough to, like, figure out what those are? No, it's like you turned to me. Taco was sleeping on my lap. I tried remembering the path I took to reach this place, but the cable car was the furthest my memories would go. Everything before that point was covered by a thick fog. Nothing that mattered if I remembered the beginning. I doubted that the path I took into this world had much of a connection to the cause, which likely happened in reality. <sighs> if you're looking for a clue, you shouldn't look for it within the dream. I felt as though she had read my mind, but she continued before I could say anything. Did Nanae say something to you? Oh yeah, she did. Nanae? An image of a person materialized in my mind. A new friend I made. She strongly reminded me of Takako. That's right. I was talking to her. I placed my arm on Takako's hair and tried remembering what happened. She said she wanted me to live with her in the mansion. Hmm. Narasaki slowly nodded. When I said nothing else, she inhaled a breath and closed her eyes. That doesn't sound too bad. I suppose so. I stroked Takako's hair. I... I'm sorry for making you worry like this. Don't be. I'm the one who should be paying more attention to you. I heard a drop of water fall in the distance. Why did you go to such a dark cave anyway? I followed her. I gave Takako's head a pat, which made her lightly squirm in her sleep. This brings back memories. Yes, she always did take me to odd places and we'd get lost. I didn't mean to ask, but why do you keep following her then? I don't know. I was afraid to let her go by herself, and I suppose I prefer spending time with her to being alone. I see. And I always scold her when that happens. We were just dis discussing that before you came. And what did you two extrapolate from this situation? If you go into the dark place following just your instincts, you'll get lost. <laughs> that makes sense. I know a few words alone won't change her. Not to mention she was particularly reckless during this period. She's still little. She can't she can't differentiate between do's and don'ts just yet. I just realized something. When she was little, Takago might have actually been testing herself. I still wish she'd been more cautious though. You're always the cautious one. You appeared calm and thoughtful, even though you didn't know much about much more than her. Was I really like that? Yeah. Most little children don't know much about the world, which is why they're always so curious about everything. They have yet to get hurt and to know fear, which leads them to want to try all sorts of things. Takuko slept with her mouth open against my chest, looking kind of foolish. Like trying on stilts that are too large, or only to lose your balance and crash to the ground. That's the kind of kid she was. Indeed. This is how kids learn about the world around them. 
She'll calm down eventually. Takako had always been interested in everything, no matter how old she got. I, on the other hand, had very few interests, like you said before. Takako closed her mouth with a silly sound and began squirming on top of me again. I see. Perhaps I was just curious why Takako was so excited about everything. I looked down to see Takako's small hand on my chest. Her tiny chest rose up and down in sync with her breathing. I wonder where she's trying to take me this time. She didn't tell you? She said she was taking me home, but it didn't seem like Takako's old house. Not the one I'm familiar with, anyway. I'm not sure if she was telling the truth, either. On the other end of the light, Narasaki stooped down a little and joined her hands on her knees, then separated them against again a few times. It's true that Takako Sanatorium is there on the other end of this tunnel. Why do you know that? I used to work there, said Narasaki in a nonchalant tone, all the while fixing her eyes on me. Okay. I had many things I wanted to ask her, but they all disappeared from my mind before I could put them into words. My head just wouldn't function properly. Narasaki was the first to speak up. You want to be with her forever? I looked at her and shook my head. If you're worried, I imagine other people would be worried about me just the same. That's not a problem. If you want to remain here, I'll take care of the other side. What do you mean, take care? I'd inconvenience a lot of people just like Raymond unconscious for the rest of my life. That's not as big of an issue as you think. If you simply dispel the state of hypnosis from your body, it won't be that different from the real you, even if your consciousness remains here. Okay. So, what would she just be then? Kind of a zombie? Yeah, it'll be capable of everything you are. You just won't be conscious of it. How can it be like me if it's not conscious of, if that consciousness is not there? People can survive without consciousness just fine. Do you remember how you ate your dinner a week ago? What kind of clothes you wore? Your consciousness already doesn't register most of the things you do, nor do the others. And even you, as the main consciousness, can't figure out why you ended up in this condition. You could switch out a person with a hollow robot and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference most of the time. Not unless you know that person extremely well. That's how he continued as I fell silent. As such, you should do whatever you want. Now that all the doors of your memories are open, you can return to any place you wish. You can attend school with Takako again. Narasaki considered the darkness to the right. The lighter, the lighter illuminate, the, the lighter illuminated the right half of Narasaki's cheeks. Then she shifted her gaze to the darkness behind me. If you go over there, you'll get to the sanatorium she currently resides at. School, huh? I enjoyed staying in the classroom after everyone had gone home to their clubs or reading books on my own. Sometimes I could hear the lousy sounds of someone practicing the trumpet in the music room. Or the racket of the boys playing football or baseball on the athletics field. I grew fond of the bustling, but not the less calm but none the none the less calm atmosphere. I only realized that after graduating and taking some time alone instead increased. You can come back. Talk to go will be there too. The boisterous atmosphere I loved pressing pressed a sense of change. Everyone at school had goals, dreams. They changed and evolved to achieve them. Going back there with Takako would mean returning to a stagnant environment. She'd be bored to death by it all. More than anything, she loves the new, the fresh. Perhaps you're right. Then how about over there? Her distant gaze returned to me. I don't know, but I still feel like it wouldn't be right. Both places exist only in my mind, so there's a little difference between them anyway. I realized Narasaki's eyes had narrowed, as though she was scrutinizing me. Then again, it could have also been just an illusion of the dim, flickering light. No, that place alone is slightly different. It's designed so that Takako, who likes new things, wouldn't get bored. Narasaki closed her mouth. I looked up and saw only darkness. I couldn't make out the ceiling. I imagined the sanatorium Takako stayed in within that darkness. I learned that Takako's here, and that's good enough for me. If that's okay with you, I have nothing else to say, said Dr. Narasaki. Let's get out of here then, she added. Okay, so, 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 so Takako in the sanatorium was all a cognitive semblance. My favorite part of the story wasn't real. It was a place where 
the Takako inside Sachiko's mind didn't die and was able to enjoy a life of constant flux and excitement. A place where she could have peace. Well, it's really sad, if I'm right. Um, there's something else I'd like to ask you. Okay, but asking something about Takako or myself would be fairly pointless. Why? You'll forget everything the moment you wake up. Are you going? Yeah, it's not like it's not like time on the other side has stopped. You wouldn't want to catch a cold, would you? Narasaki stood up and patted her coat to see if it had dried up. It had, which didn't particularly surprise me. So, how do we leave? I'll walk out. You should just go to sleep if you start feeling drowsy. That's all I need to do? Yeah. I'll leave the lighter with you. Having stayed in the darkness for so long, it's possible your consciousness might melt away or something before you even get the chance to grow sleepy. Don't leave this area, okay? Okay. She's like, between worlds. Narasaki nodded. I realized something by coming here. The reason I made up that story about Takako going missing. I probably- oh, that's, and this is Sachiko. I probably couldn't acknowledge this Takako was no longer here. Why do you think that? I glanced at the tiny sleeping Takako. Because it hurts. A lot. I struck Takako's hair. I see. Narasaki. I wanted to ask her what she thought of it, but quickly changed my mind. It's important what I think, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Well then. Well then. Narasaki turned towards the darkness. Are you going to be okay? It's no big deal. Narasaki smiled. Is there anything else bothering you? No, I'm sure you'll be fine. Oh no, this is not I flipped it again. No, I'm sure you'll be fine, no matter what happens. I will. Don't don't you need any light? My eyes have gotten used to the dark by now. I see. Good night, and sweet dreams. Thanks. Is she gonna be gone too? Narsaki waved me goodbye and disappeared into the darkness. Her footsteps grew distant until I could no longer hear them. The light seemed to have grown somewhat smaller compared to when Narasaki was here. What the heck? Oh my gosh. This has been insane. Normally I'd be like, this has been long enough, but I think I need at least a little bit more because I need to make sure she actually wakes up. Our voices might have grown too loud as Takako began lightly squirming on Sachiko's lap. Sachiko pulled her hand on Takako's head, making her calm down. Perhaps I was just curious why Takako was so excited about everything. I could see Takako's closed eyelids through Sachiko's hands. They relaxed for a second and seemed to open and close tight again. Her point the ponytail cast a long shadow in the lighter's light. I felt my body grow heavy as I observed her. I could really go for a drink. Perhaps. I slowly stood up, feeling like a statue made of stone. <sighs> I should be on my way. So, how do we leave? I'll walk out. You should just go to sleep if you start feeling drowsy. That's all I need to do. So I was repeating, but from Narasaki's point of view. Yeah, I'll leave the lighter with you. Having stayed in this darkness for so long, it's possible your consciousness might melt away or something before you even get a chance to grow sleepy. Don't leave this area, okay? Okay. Well then, I turned towards the darkness. Are you going to be okay? Sachiko asked. It's no big deal. Is there anything else bothering you? No, I'm sure you'll be fine, no matter what happens. I will. Don't you need any light? My eyes have gotten used to the dark by now. I see. Good night and sweet dreams. Thanks. I walked for a while, then glanced back. The light had turned into a vague orange dot in the distance. 
As I continued on, it began moving toward the left before completely disappearing, almost like the setting sun. From here on out, I'd be in complete darkness. The floor was the first thing that disappeared from my vision. Couldn't even tell if I was ascending or descending a slope. I glanced down to realize I couldn't see my legs anymore. The darkness crawled up and up until I couldn't even see the tips of my nose. I'm thinking Narasaki is a cognitive being, effectively, like a consciousness, and I think this is actually going to be her end, because I don't think Sachiko will need her anymore. With my eyes completely unable to perceive light, I had no way of telling where I was. I strained my senses to try and feel for something, but all I managed to discern was a thick darkness pressing heavily against my skin. The more I walked, the heavier it got. I remembered a TV program where they carried out an experiment by submerging a water bottle in a ball of the sea. Both ended up crushed by the water pressure. Mm -hmm. I felt this of the darkness was seeping into me through my eyes and skin. It was slowing my pace. I feared I might be immobilized completely. I continued pressing forward with all my strength when an image appeared in the darkness. I turned my face away and closed my eyes to let it pass. However, the image wasn't created by light, but by my own mind. I could hear the cry of cicadas around me. There was a small mountain of sand piled up in the middle of the sandbox, with a tunnel passing right through it. Countless water canals surrounded it on all sides. Finishing her masterpiece, Takugo stood up and shook the sand off her hands. She turned the water supply, uh, supply Sachiko was sitting on in front of. Sachiko had a doll and a towel in her hands. What are you doing? She was wiping the doll's face with a wet towel. Her face, her face got all dirty. Did you get it off? It's not working. There are some visibly brown stains on the face of Sachiko's doll. Let's ask the nurse. Nurse! Takugo let out a loud shout. What happened? The young woman who had been tidying up the toys scattered inside the building turned to Takako with a yellow toy card in her hand. The doll got dirty. Can you get it cleaned up? A somewhat feisty looking woman approached them and looked at Sachiko's doll over Takako's head. This looks like a stain. I guess it'd be possible to wash it out if you undid the sewing, but then it might actually fall apart. Sachiko's fingers clutched the doll tighter. You can't fix it? I don't think it's worth the risk. Sachiko considered the doll's face for a long while. <sighs> Make sure to take care of her if you want to keep playing with her. The nurse gently patted Sachiko's head a few times. <sighs> Memories were leaking forth from the deepest corners of my mind, from the very boundary of the consciousness and the subconscious. As the vision paused, I instead focused my senses on my limbs. I balled my hand into a fist with all my strength, successfully swaying my consciousness away from that memory. With that, I once again returned to the pitch black darkness. It seemed I'd stopped before I realized. I didn't know how long it was long I lost in that memory. When I resumed walking, I couldn't even tell if it was really moving or not. Before long, I could no longer sense my body at all. Well now, I said, unable to tell if I was really hearing my own words or if that came from some distant memory again. I felt as though my arms and legs had melted into the darkness. Perhaps I had returned to being just a doll, like those old memories. I inhaled a deep breath and slowly let it out. I remembered how I talked to Sachiko just earlier. She said it was odd to see me and Takako together. In that moment, I felt something different about her. Her expression and body language seemed to have grown richer. However, I couldn't tell what that meant. I wonder if she could tell her if I if I should tell her. But in the end, I decided not to. The lighter's light had been flickering in front of Sachiko's eyes. And from her perspective, I should have been sitting right beyond it. Ever so faintly, feeling returned to the tips of my toes and fingers. I calculated where my head was supposed to be from their position and fixed my eyes on the darkness. It was the real thing. Complete darkness that melted the consciousness away. A phenomenon very similar to death. With some feeling having returned to my fingers, I began rhythmically moving them in an attempt to hypnotize myself. My legs moved unconsciously. My eyes could have seen anything, but my heart wouldn't move. All sorts of images appeared in front of my eyes. Nonetheless, my legs pushed me ever onwards.
Okay. Sachiko took a box off the top shelf of the closet, checked what was inside, and then returned it to the same place. There were two more boxes in the closet. They had Takako's written on them in big letters. Sachiko pulled the biggest box into the room and looked at many other boxes she had collected. There were already two transparent containers in front of the closet. <sighs> I don't know why I'm suddenly getting emotional. I don't know why. <laughs> like, why? Like, why am I suddenly feeling so sad? She moved one of them with her legs and placed the box beside it. Gosh darn it. No, seriously, what the heck's happening? Nothing sad's happening. Inside the box were a carving knife, a flute, a knitting set, and all sorts of other trinkets that Takako probably used back in school. Sajiko took them out of the box one by one, separating each item into two categories, important things and trash. She crushed a paper bag that was mixed with other articles and put it into the trash container. There's a radio cassette player underneath it. She plugged it into the electrical socket and flipped the switch. A familiar melody of cold, gloomy room uh, uh, filled the cold, gloomy room through the static. Sajiko turned around and looked at the bed. A doll she'd left on the edge had fallen down to the floor. Sachiko reached out and picked it up. Its lips had frozen to a perpetual, almost conf con uh, confrontational smile. Its somewhat sardonic expression as it looked over the room made the doll appear almost like it was eager to ask a question or two. This too brings back memories, but I was looking for something else, said Sachiko as she turned the cassette player off. The melody stopped and the cold, gloomy room once again fell into silence. Sachiko took out a blue rectangular shaped kion from another box. There were several radio cassettes inside. Back in middle school, Takako recorded her own radio show onto a cassette. Oh gosh, that'd be terrible to listen to. Don't do that. I wonder which one it was. I believe it should have been a yellow tape. Sajiko took out a yellow cassette tape from the can and pushed it into the player. The cassette holder sounded a, rust sounded, sounded a rusty yet vigorous click. I remember these things. Sajiko put her finger on the play button. Hesitated for a moment, then pressed it. An old pop song began playing from the player. As the song ended, Takako's voice suddenly rang out through the static. She said it was the first song she'd ever bought. Then she said this was her first recording and congratulated herself. Her show was basically her talking about her day and introducing music she liked. There were no guest corner. Um, there were no guest corners or letter reading sessions, of course. I tried listening to the radio show at night, and it was much more fun than I expected. When I told Takako, oh, that's, this is Sachiko. When I told Takako about it, she brought this tape to school the next day. She said it was really weird to hear her own voice come through the recorder, and that she now wanted to learn how to sing or something. Sachiko smiled. She then continued to talk about history of the old cassette player. It used to be in Takako's house. The two listened to the radio and cassettes they bought. Sachiko paused and listened to the song Takako had introduced. She then began talking again. She shared her personal information with the almost gleeful expression. Sachiko continued to listen to the tape with the doll in her lap. Before I realized that she had closed her eyes. I couldn't tell if she was sleeping or just absorbed in the music. The tape suddenly stopped in the middle of Takako's speech. Sachiko opened her eyes and took the tape out. She flipped it around and put it back in the holder and pressed the play button. Now that I think about it, we dropped by Takako's old house sometime after getting our first jobs. But this cassette player was no longer there by that time. It's not like we would have listened to it anyway, but... She faced the doll, but her eyes were gazing somewhere far away. She seemed to have been wondering why they weren't listening to the music. If I could go back in time, I'd love to show her some better songs. Sachiko stood up and picked up the cassette player with one hand while holding the doll in the other. She then walked up over to the bed. She sat down on the edge, placing the player on the side table and the doll her, by her pillow. Sachiko turned around and saw Takako on the bed. She extended her hand and touched her. <sighs> Hang on. Sorry, knocked something over. I'll play my favorite song next. A very old western song came to life through the speakers. I looked up the meaning of the lyrics. Everything has its me has a meaning. Even if I don't have them now, time will bring them answers. Gosh darn it, why am I sad? Why am I sad? 
This is my favorite song. I don't know why, but I really like it. I hope you all eventually come to understand why. What an idiot, Sachiko murdered, murmured. Nonetheless, she made a smile. Perhaps you recall the time when they listened to that song together. Taco said it'd be the last song for the day. They began playing. As the song came to an end, the tape stopped. The room fell completely silent. <sighs> I think I'm just kind of... It's stupid, I know, but... I think I'm sad because... With all the mystery going on, I didn't really get to... Like, I knew there was stuff that was going on that was sad. But, like, I didn't know what was real. So I kind of just went with it. But I think we finally kind of figured out what's going on now. How all this has really just been parts of Sachiko's brain trying to figure things out. It was all just kind of sad. I'm sad that the Takako memories we've been reading, like at the Skeletorium, weren't real. I'm sad imagining uh, Dr. Narasaki, who's been so important to Sachiko, not being real. <laughs> and just imagining a life where you had to live and choose to live in a world without the people you love. Rather than retreating into your own brain and just hiding there forever. It's just, I don't know. It's weird. Like, I really don't know. When when I've been hitting emotional parts in Science Gate or Mop Love, I understand why I'm feeling strong emotions during those times. You know, it's, the story's gone there, the music's there. But this story, it just kind of hit me. And it had almost no music now comforting just kind of this alien world and concepts surrounding like real tragedy I don't know why I'm feeling like I, I'm feeling emotions and I'm not sure why it's ridiculous Sachiko realized her door with bell was ringing she didn't know whether she had fallen asleep or was simply too deep in thought by the time she glanced at the clock it was already midnight Still, the doorbell was definitely ringing. Such a good notice of light coming from one of the rooms. She went to the bed before sunset, so there's no way she'd turn on any of the lights. She glanced at the door by the pillow and embraced it. The doll by the pillow and embraced it. She listened to the sound in her bitter cold, bitterly cold bed. The sound of the doorbell seemed to have grown distant. What am I supposed to do? I could have sworn she said something. However, both her words and the doorbell became barely audible to me. As a... It felt as though everything I observed was happening somewhere far away in another world. Oh, so, so sad. So sad. I don't know why. I want to keep going, but I don't know if I should. I stepped on something and almost tripped. It felt softer than the rocky ground I've been walking on so far. Upon kicking it, I heard a wooden thump. I prodded it a few more times with my toes, making it quiver. The quivering extended across the entire cave, turning into rumbling. Oh, fetch! Two bright lights lit up as I traveled through the area. I looked down to see train tracks below my feet. I shaded my eyes with my hand and looked around, eventually spotting a hole in the wall. I stepped into the hole just moments before a giant object with headlights zoomed past me, the light from its windows flickering in the darkness. I couldn't make out any human shapes to the west beyond said windows, though. After the train had passed, I climbed out the hole and brushed the dust off my clothes. Looking at the direction the train went, I could see lights of the outside world. I followed the train tracks outside, eventually merging into a forest covered by fog. The moon perched in the dark blue sky right above the mountains and trees. I didn't know what time it was. Following the now abandoned railway line, I eventually made out the roof of the mansion looming beyond the trees. So she made it back to that world.
The familiar path led me back to the western style mansion I knew so well. As I emerged on the road leading to the library, I took a turn towards the entrance of the mansion's inner yard. The doors weren't locked. I turned the doorknob and silently stepped inside. The lights weren't on, weren't on in the corridor leading to the lobby, so I couldn't see very far. Making my way down the corridor, I managed to reach the lobby. My grandfather clock towered to my right. Its arrow was pointed at the time of, say, 4 o'clock. Thinking about how much time it had until sunrise, I was just about to ascend the stairwell when I noticed the silhouette of someone behind the counter. Hello. Good evening. The silhouette addressed me in Lily's voice. Good evening. Nana, I was really worried, but he didn't show up for dinner. With no moonlight, the darker the, it was darker inside the lobby than outside. As a result, even though my eyes had grown used to the dark outside, I still couldn't make out her very well in the make her out very well in the room. I couldn't tell what kind of expression she wore, but despite the reminiscent content content of her words, I felt I felt a gentle and caring air from her. I made a sour face. I felt like a kid that broke her curfew. I'm sorry. Lily turned to the side and made a light yawn. Have you been have you been waiting for me all this time? Lily surely shook her head. I woke up in the middle of the night and decided to simply kill some time here. I wonder if I'm getting old. Whenever this happens, I usually come here to think. Still, I didn't have a feeling I did have a feeling you'd come back coming back, so that was a part of the reason too. What do you normally think about here? All sorts of things. Lily didn't say anything else. She must have fallen deep in thought. A whisper reached my ear, even though even from this distance. However, compared to that whisper, some of her previous words would pass me by and go too far and wouldn't reach me properly. She appeared to have been t testing how low her voice could go with me still hearing it, almost like she was fine-tuning a sonar system. That was a bit too complicated for me, so instead I simply walked over to the counter where I could finally see her sitting in a chair. She looked up at me. What were you doing outside at such a late hour? I went outside for a walk, but ended up getting lost. Lily's expression clouded over. Not many people come to our mountains, which made the area a relatively popular suicide spot. Really? As you can see, we don't have that many guests at this inn. Usually only two or three, even during the high season. And most of them are irregulars. It's rare to have even a single guest during the off-season. That was fine, though. That I can see. As I imagine what Lily could be thinking about her here at nights. She continued. I've been working here for a long time. I've seen many guests that come back, and many that didn't. What kind of deaths didn't come back? Some we found, others we didn't, Lily said with a sigh. I remembered the mountain I saw from the mansion window. It was covered with trees from top to bottom. Couldn't even make out the roads. It couldn't have been that easy to find a person in there. Um, can I tell you something odd? Sure. In retrospect, all those guests had a particular air that separated them from the rest. Well, I imagine they come off as different compared to regular tourists. I suppose so, but I don't think it's as simple. It wasn't just their personalities or a few quirks. When I saw them, the difference I'd felt was about as large and obvious as a sudden change of color on a shape of an object. How do I look to you? I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I notice you have the same kind of air about you. Although, there's something unusual about it in your case. When I first saw you, I only felt like you were half of you. Well, long story short, I was worried for you, too, though maybe in a slightly different way from Nana, eh? Perhaps what she was saying was the truth. I grew curious about her method of sensing these things, but it probably wasn't something that could be explained overnight. Your face is all red, Lily suddenly said. I touched my cheek, feeling as cold as ice. I might have been warmly dressed, but I did spend most of the night outside. A fairly natural consequence, but being so deep in thought, I didn't notice it at all. I think you should take a shower before going to bed. Do you want me to heat up the bath? No, I'll be fine. I waved my hand in denial when she made the trouble expression. Then uh, can I at least make you something warm to drink? I'd, I'd love that. 
I felt as though I'd made her worry even more if I refused, so I had her deliver the drink to my room. <sighs> Turned on the heater as I returned to the room and changed it to my inside clothes. I combed my hair for a while and tidied up the room to kill some time. I moved everything from the table as well as the coat from the chair out of sight. Finishing that, I looked out the window. It was dark outside. Couldn't even see the moon. Lily knocked on my door. Okay, so I'm thinking Narasaki and Sachiko are technically the same. Because there's no reason for Nanae to be worrying about Sachiko, from what I can tell. It shouldn't grow much colder tonight, but it's a good idea to keep the heater on when you sleep. I nodded. You can keep the tray in your room. Thank you very much. Don't mention it, said Lily with a smile. She then closed the door. I placed the tray on the table, sat down in a nearby chair, and picked up the cup. It warmed my frozen hand through the porcelain coating. I could tell by the sweet smell the liquid inside was cocoa. There was also a small plate on the tray with cookies, strawberry jam, or at least some sweets that looked very much like that. I gave the cookies a careful look as I continued sipping my cocoa. A lot happened tonight. I felt as if I'd been ages since I'd been sitting, begun, been sitting in to, been into this room. I thought about Sachiko. I felt responsible for her ending up in that dark cave. It wasn't Nane's words that caused it all. Regardless of what happened, there was no way she could have reached that cave leading to the other side by her, all by herself. It was a place for beings like myself, and only I could have known the way to it. I didn't know how, but my existence probably led her there somehow. When I came to, I realized that both the cup and the sweet plate were empty. Walking for so long must have made me hungrier than I thought. I glanced at the bed, but didn't feel sleepy at all. After thinking for a few moments, I placed the empty cup on the tray, picked it up, and then left the room. <sighs> Lily was still behind the counter in the lobby when I came down the stairs. Listen, she didn't even call herself human. Narasaki knows that she's not something the matter? Thank you very much for the treats. Having a hard time slowing asleep? I asked Lily as she took the tray from me and shoved it in the cupboard. Seems that way. I might not be one to talk, but tell you to go to sleep while it's still dark. I agree, I said with a nod, then asked if it wasn't colder in here. I'm used to it. It doesn't bother me when I'm so deep in thought. Why do you, why do you do your thinking here in the lobby? That's a good question. It would take a while to explain, though. How long, exactly? Quite long. I wouldn't want you to freeze to death while listening to me at any rate. She said she would have plenty more opportunity to talk. However, I didn't feel like being alone right now. Besides, there's something I wanted to ask her. Can we maybe talk in my room, then? Hmm. Lily paused to think for a few seconds, then asked me if I wanted more cocoa. Yes, please. Lily nodded. Then we can talk until we finish the cup. Actually, I was getting bored here by myself, too. Lily stood up, took out the tray from the cupboard again, stepped out from behind the counter. I returned to my room and turned up the heat a bit. I waited in front of it until I heard the knock at the door. Opening the door, I saw Lily standing there in an apron. There were two cups in the tray she carried, as well as a cloth bag hanging from her right elbow. We sat down at the table facing each other. Lily handed me one of the cups, then picked the other one up and took a sip. Back in the past, my friend would go out at nights just like you, and I'd wait for her in the lobby like this. You have to pass by it regular you have to pass by it reg regardless of the entrance you use. Who was it? The same friend I mentioned to you before, the one that went missing. I remembered Lily's horror story from two days ago. So that was a real story after all. I dramatized it a little, but it's true that my friend disappeared. You may remember how I said that she and I both lived here for a long time, so there's no need to worry about her getting lost or anything, but that time it was different. It happened shortly after her young daughter passed away. How did she pass away? She drowned in the river. I almost couldn't believe it at first, as the rivers here are really shallow. 
We had lots of rain over a period of a few weeks, and the increased water apparently loosened the riverbed. It was like she stepped into quicksand, ended up being sucked underwater. My friend's husband passed away some time before that, too. Oh, fetch. Anyway, she was severely depressed during that period. I picked up the cup, which reminded me that I hadn't even started my drink yet. Either way, I lifted my cup as well. The sweet aroma of the cocoa washed over my nostrils as I drew the cup closer to my lips. She was always such a high-spirited and cheerful person, but after the incident she began shutting up in her room. Even when we'd met once in the blue moon, she'd barely speak. One day, around the time I started thinking about how I should do something for her before things spiraled out of control, I spotted her going out into the inner yard. When I approached her, she actually had an unusual, cheerful expression. I asked her what she was doing. She told me she spotted a rare butterfly through her window. A butterfly? Yes. She used to collect insects as a hobby. I asked her if she wanted me to bring an insect net, but she refused. Anyway, seeing her like that relieved me a little. I figured she managed to get over it somehow. She resumed her work as usual and went back to talking like she used to. She even began smiling again. I heard a clang. I glanced down to see Lily's cup on the tray. But after a few days, she went outside and never came back. I could see what was inside her cup. I thought about all sorts of things as I watched, waited for her to, at the counter. Where was she right now? Why didn't she tell me anything? What was the name of that rare butterfly she spotted? You didn't go looking for her? I looked for her everywhere I could think of, but I had a feeling I wouldn't find her. I didn't really think she'd return, even when she was, even when I was waiting in the lobby. I don't know why I felt that way, but it was almost certain I was right. But I didn't have a similar feeling, nor do I suspect anything back when she was still around. So I think the cause that made her disappear lies somewhere beyond my knowledge. Maybe somewhere in her room, seeing how she used to lock herself up there so often. I felt my throat getting dry, so I took a sip of coffee. No cocoa. But I digress. You want to know why I spend my nights behind the counter? Probably because that place has always been where I spent most of my time thinking. I wonder if she was still waiting for her friend, but it wasn't really my business to pry. Instead, I asked her about something I found curious. The premonition you were talking about. That was the same feeling you talked about when I came tonight, right? Yes. You said that only half of me made you feel it, though. It was very odd, I admit. How about now? I don't feel that strongly anymore. The anxiety in my heart let up at her words. So... Sachiko. Sachiko's not wanting to vanish anymore. That half probably been me. Oh, okay. If her intuition was on point, the only remaining issue was the question of my existence. I see. I grew curious about the exact mechanism that drove her premonition, but didn't feel like she'd be able to explain it in a manner comprehensible to me. That's right. Lily raised her face as she pulled out something from the bag she'd placed by her chair. It was the doll I gave her two days ago. I'll return this to you. I took the doll from her hands and gave it a look. The stains had vanished along with any trace of loose threads. It looked more colorful than before. You actually had to strain your eyes to make out any traces of the stain in the doll's mouth. What do you think? I couldn't completely get rid of all the stains, but I still think it came up pretty well. I'll be honest, I never expected it to be this clean. I'm glad to hear that. I looked at the doll's face one more time. Its perpetual smile seemed to be beam with pride. Looking at its face made me feel a mixture of sadness and bittersweet joy. So much so that I ended up knitting my brows. Me too, man. Me too. Well, I suppose the time was on my way. Lily placed her empty cup on the saucer beneath her on the tray. I gulped down the remaining cocoa still up to the bottom of my cup. I felt like ice. Did you invite me to tea because I gave you that feeling? <laughs> Back then, I was just curious about Nanae's new friend. I placed my empty cup on the tray. However, Lily remained seated. Her eyes traveled between the doll and my face. You'll think I'm strange, but what is it? It's the first time I've told anyone about this. 
I might have all sorts of feelings and premonitions, but I normally keep them to myself. Then why did you tell me? You remind me of my friend. A, a lot. And I thought to keep this by myself, but... Lily's gaze shifted to the doll. I never learned why my friend left us, but in your case, I feel like it's somehow related to that doll. I was flabbergasted by the keenness of her intuition. However, I made sure not to let the surprise show on my face. Her remark completely overlapped with my own conclusion. Why did you think that? It's mostly my intuition, but after my friend's daughter passed away, she carried a memento of hers everywhere. I felt like this doll had a similar history. I see. Lily's dark brown eyes gazed at the doll. It belongs to my friend. I too shifted my eyes to the clean doll. She would confide in it when things got tough, but I don't think she needs it anymore. She's not exactly at an age to play with dolls anymore, and I feel the doll itself was getting frustrated by not being able to do anything to help. Oh, she, what are they called? There's a term for this. Uh, it's Japanese folklore, and I only know it in a cursory fashion, but it's this idea that, like, as objects get older and have more sentimental value, they slowly develop a type of consciousness, and they can grow up into a kind of, like, demon, I guess you could say, like, like a spirit, and that, like, there's the concepts that these objects can eventually become alive, and... I don't know, could be considered like guardians of the family or, or tricksters or something. And I think that's what Narasaki is. She's a personified friend that's not Shiko needed in her darkest times and was given life by the fractured nature of Sachiko's brain. Like, <laughs> she's like an imaginary friend who's actually there for you. <laughs> she stood up with her bag hanging from her elbow and picked up the tray. I did the same and opened the door for her. Thanks. I saw a whole bunch of leaves scattered by the door. Are you going to clean them up tomorrow morning too? Yes. What about you? I'll go for a walk after I get some sleep. That's a good idea. Let's have another chat and the opportunity swings by. Sure. Good night. And with that, Lily left the room. After saying goodbye, I closed the door. Sorry, a little sniffly. I'm gonna have to stop there. I was literally just gonna get freaking long if I go much further. I don't know. Okay, so another tip. At the end of the second trip was unlocked. <sighs> so, I don't really know what the rest of the story is going to be, but I feel like we're probably close to the end now. If you guys can confirm that for me, just let me know. Like, do you think I have like one or two more episodes left of this? But uh, I don't know why this made me so sad. Like, I really don't know. I can't piece it together like in my head it doesn't make any sense why I got so emotional and I'm still so emotional um I guess I've always liked the concept of a being a person a personality being there for you in a way that's not like normal um I loved the concept in uh the Golden Compass, uh, the Amber, the Amber Spyglass, like that series of the uh, daemons, like the, the little animals that would follow you around that were like an extension of your of your soul. Um, I love in the Brandon Sanderson books, uh, the Spren in uh, the Stormlight Archive. There are these uh, these pockets of of intelligence. The personified, like, it's like a physical personification of the thoughts of men. That we conceptualize things like the wind being alive, uh, fire dancing. We give them these humanistic characteristics. And in that world, eventually that actually warps 
like the 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 cognitive version of these of these essences it turns them into an actual intelligence and when they bond with a person they give them powers and intel and, and like they give each and then the human gives them cognition and stuff it's these concepts of these like portions of your soul or are beings that like work with you and that together like you can have this bond of like of friendship and trust and something that's always I don't know something I've always wanted because sometimes it's hard to find unconditional like friendship unconditional love and even in your closest friends and family and and, and significant others there's always parts of you or at least if you're like me there's always parts of me that I feel like are just still mine like there's parts of me that are still kind of lonely because there's parts of me I don't get to share with anybody. I I think for me it's tough because I'm a very complicated person. <laughs> I've got a lot of I've got a lot to me and I don't think there's ever going to be a person who can ever just understand everything about me. Like obviously my wife is the closest, but I still feel like there's a little bit of me that even she doesn't know. And so to have a person like Narasaki, even if it wasn't a person, it's a cool idea. I'm going to be sad to see her go. I'll be sad to see her go. Anyway, I'm sorry for the long episode, <laughs> especially for Seabed. This is a very unusual length. I just couldn't stop. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you. Or dealing with the fact that I'm still a crybaby. Gosh darn it. I just can't. I can't, I can't lie. I can't stop feeling these feelings. And I don't know. I don't even understand these feelings. This is It's so bizarre to me. Because I don't understand why I'm feeling why I'm feeling right now. I don't know why. And I don't know why it hit me when it did. It's not like there was anything at that point that was really sad. This has been a happy episode more or less. Why? Is it so strong, though? I don't know. I never expected this story to be this meaningful to me. If I'm honest. I just didn't think it would happen. But here we are. Anyway, I need to stop laughing on. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, if you liked Steins Gate, tomorrow we'll be doing a live stream, assuming I don't have issues. I've been having some problems with my boys. But we should be doing a live stream and... Oh, no, not tomorrow. Yeah, no, there's tomorrow when we broadcast it. That's right. Um, if you want to stick around for that, please do. It's going to be a pure experiment. I have no idea if it's even going to work at all. But yeah, we'll get done. We'll get it done. Thank you. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing your comments. I hope this is an interesting one for you. <laughs> Thanks for everything you guys do. You guys are what make this channel so great. I love talking to you about this. and. Even though it's been one of the smaller series, it's obviously been one that's become kind of impactful to me. So I appreciate that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for everything you do. Thank you so much for sticking around. And until the next video watches me or whatever you see me in next, I'll see you there. <laughs>